out there on the internet. How's it going? Uh, today we're going to make some pictures and here are a couple of examples of different pictures, uh, very different from one another. And I'll make neither of these today. I'll make something that's uh, not either of these things that we're looking at. But these are an idea of what pictures can be like. And this, for example, is a picture that I've pulled the handle off of. So I'm going to try and do that. Uh, forewarned, it is not my specialty. And I don't do it very often, which is a great time to, this is always a great time to try something new in front of a lot of people. And this is a more of a strap handle uh, that, I, that I've also pulled. And I'll show you how to pull one of these as well. And on this thing, you can see it's actually kind of, it's got like a booty here. And this was darted. Uh, and that's a cutting, it's like, you know, uh, on, on a piece of clothing where you dart a piece of clothes. So, um, we're going to start off by preparing the clay. Don't worry, I'm coming back into the frame soon. So this is, I'm going to make a, a kind of a, it's very unnerving to me to not see my face when I'm talking, which is so bizarre because I never see myself when I'm speaking, but <clears throat> uh, we're going to make a pretty large picture today. And can I click on my side? There we go. Okay. We're going to make a pretty large pitcher today. This is going to be a one gallon pitcher, uh, which looks really gigantic, and it is quite large. Um, but it is very useful if you ever have a party or anything like that. They're great to have for uh, cocktails or just like iced tea, sort of class it up. And I'm going to start out by just sort of preparing the clay. This has already been wedged. This is, this is five pounds of clay. I'm using uh, standard S257, which is just, it's just awesome. Uh, they're not paying me to say that. I, I love it so much. It's there. It's, it's an English porcelain, and it's, it's so plastic. I've been working with this terrible clay for three years, and of all of the things that I'm totally unsure of right now, I'm so happy that I switched to this clay like today. I went to Ceramic Supply in New Jersey mm -hmm. and I bought a bunch of this stuff. And I also went to, to Hank's uh, Red Hot Hot Dog Stand, which if you ever go to Lodi, New Jersey, you should go to if it's still there. It's really good, yeah. You know what I'm talking about, fantastic. Um, nice yes, yeah, yeah, it's right, you can't miss it. You, you, you have to drive by it to, to leave. Um, and is that cone 10, Hawkins? This, this is, uh, it's rated cone 8 to cone 10, but I'll tell you what, when I did cone 6, uh, I, I used this and it was great. Um, and uh, it was pretty strong and uh, hygienic. Um, but yeah, it goes up to cone 10. Soup, very white, very plastic, really plastic throwing body. And what I want to point out is, the reason why I'm starting with this ball of clay like this is you'll notice this is the spiral from the wedging, okay? Sometimes you might, if you do ram's head wedging, you have a spiral on both this side and this side. I did something called spiral wedging, which I'm not gonna show you how to do, but you'll notice you get this spiral here. And it is a pretty nice shape to start throwing, right? This looks like kind of the, what I would want a ball of clay to look like when I'm gonna center. But I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna use it like this, right? Why, why is that? So years ago, uh, I took a, for my birthday for my 30th birthday, I took a, a workshop with uh, Bandana Pottery. Uh, they're a husband and wife team out of North Carolina, and they pointed out that they think that this spiral looks a lot like an S crack. And I would say that that's probably pretty pseudo scientific, and a lot of people who I respect greatly, have told me, actually, no, the spiral prevents S-cracking. However, at the time that I heard it, it made a lot of sense to me. And I will say that I'd been doing ceramics for maybe, at that point, like 13 or 14 years, and I, I was pretty good. Um, but I was getting a lot of S-cracks, more, more often than I would like. And if you're familiar with my own work, um, 
you know, I sign the bottom of my pots when they're greenware, and that makes it really impossible to cover up any S cracks with yeah. uh, with some paper clay or or like a, a matte gla glaze or something like that. So I, I really, I was like, well, I'm going to try it. And I'll, I'll tell you what, I think at this point, this was two years ago now, right? I think, I think I'm 32. I don't know. Um, but it, I, I get like maybe one to three S crack pots a year. So work for me. <laughs> but, it, but if you don't have S cracking problems, if, the, if it never happens to you, then don't change uh, what you're doing uh, and do what I'm doing here. Don't change that. So, but what am I going to do? So you notice that this is the spiral. The tendency is to put it down here. Instead, I'm going to make it so the spiral is going this way. And what I tell my students all the time is what way, uh, there's a little, a little question you ask yourself, what direction is the clay supposed to be moving in? And the answer is like the wheels on the bus going round and round, the clay should go this way. Okay. So I'm going to just bang this into, a, into another shape that's gonna be easier for me to throw. And that, this way the orientation of the spiral will be going in the same direction as the wheel. Or sorry, as the wheels on the bus. Okay? So this is gonna be something that's gonna be pretty nice for me to center. But I have this thing here now I have a new sort of butt crack situation and you always want to get rid of this. Don't leave this here. Even if you like bang it down and it's flat, what you're going to end up with is you're going to end up with like a little kind of armpit butt crack space on a pot. And if you haven't thrown pots for long enough, you maybe haven't experienced this, but if you throw pots a lot, you'll have experience throwing the best pot you've ever made. It's so good. The form is just killer. Man, you love everything about it. It's perfect. And then it gets to be hard enough that you can turn it upside down. And there's just a butt crack in the pot. It's not a crack, but it's a crevice. And you've got to trim around it. And it's really annoying. It's because air is going to get trapped underneath the clay. So with every piece of clay, not just for pictures, but every piece of clay that I put down on the wheel head, I do this. I rotate it on an axis so that I get a point. Okay, so what that's gonna do is it's gonna make sure that the clay hits the wheel head <clears throat> and doesn't trap any air down here. Now, before I jump this off, before I jump into throwing this, in case you didn't think I could talk about other stuff uh, any longer, I, I wanna point out that I'm using this sort of wooden, this thicker wooden bat that I really like. And I really like these because uh, they don't warp as easily. Also, if you ever have to make like, a 10 pole, a 10 pound salad bowl that's really big or a big platter. These thicker MDF boards, they, they just hold their shape a lot better. Um, and also they don't fly off the wheel when you're throwing things that are tall and vertical. But why am I saying this to you? Well, you know, you might think about investing in some that are for your own private use, even if you're in a, uh, a communal studio like Brooklyn Clay, but if you do, you need to know something. I, I didn't learn this for a long time. You gotta put some water down on here first. So if you do this with a plastic bat, your pot's gonna slide off the wheel head like a Jeep Cherokee on a rainy day. But instead, with these, we need to do it, we need to add a little water on here. And that's because otherwise the clay, the moisture from the clay is gonna absorb into the bat and you'll be working on it, it'll just kind of pop off. Just put a little water in here. Okay, got my handy rag here. How's this view? Pretty good, yeah. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I tend to work back here because I, uh, I kind of lean my butt up against the wall. Uh, so I might do the centering for this, but I'll try and, I'll try and do some of the throwing over here so that you guys can see uh, what it is that, that I'm doing a little bit better. Okay. This is really a throwback to my childhood Tom and Jerry days with this headless 
talking figure here. Maybe people don't know what I'm talking about. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's a cartoon joke. Um, first thing I'm going to do here is dry center this a bit. So no water, just dry. And this is just me kind of faking it into the middle so I don't have to work that hard. Um, Did you just read the chat, Hawkins? Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, and so centering something like this, number one, uh, here are just three things that I have to consider when, when preparing this. A lot of stuff has to go into consideration before you start making something like this. So number one, the clay should be really the consistency that you want it to be. If the clay is too soft, you should make it into an arch and dry it out. Or you can roll it into a slab a couple of times and that'll dry the clay out pretty quickly. You're gonna need clay that's gonna be the right consistency. If it's too soft, it's, it's gonna, it's not, you're not gonna be able to pull it efficiently enough. And Likewise, if I spend a lot of time centering up and down, coning up and down, coning up and down, I'm adding tons of water to it and it's going to become a little oversaturated and softer than I want it to be. That matters even more with porcelain than any other clay body because of the particle size. I won't go into that. But, uh, sorry, there's a kid, the kid next door to me is always playing basketball. I thought someone was breaking into my, my patio here. Uh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, I don't want to cone it up and down too much. Um, and that's, that's because I don't want to add a lot of water to it. And why is that? I don't want to add a lot of water to it because pitchers, for the most part, are the only forms that you make on the wheel that are not going to be trimmed. There are times when you might trim a pitcher, but usually you're going to end up actually throwing one section of the pitcher, letting it get leather hard, trimming it, cutting a foot in the bottom, and then re-centering re it and putting another piece on. That's usually how people have a cut foot in a trimmed pitcher. But for this, it's got to be good, right? Most of the time I'm saying to my students, don't worry about throwing that extra clay. Leave some clay down there. Let it, let it be there so you can, you can articulate yourself better in the trimming. But for this, we really have to throw it uh, very seriously. We really gotta, gotta throw it so it's not, it doesn't become a doorstop. Okay, we want, we want to ultimately fill a gallon of water in here, which is like about seven pounds. So this is, this is five pounds of clay, okay? And centering is always the negotiation between an X, a Y, and a Z axis, right? So I'm pushing in, my two hands are directly opposing one another. My, I'm centering with my, the heel of my palm on my left hand, okay? And I don't know what this part of my palm is called, but where my fingers meet my palm. And the heel of my left and this part of my right need to be mirror, mirroring each other, okay? So if this hand, I'm going to be applying pressure at about seven o'clock and that's not, not six o'clock because if I do six o'clock, I got to bend my wrists a lot. So I want to do a kind of a seven so that it looks like this. Okay. And then this is going to be uh, sevens on this hand. My right hand will be at one o'clock. Whatever you do, it could be whatever, eight and two. It doesn't matter that much. But what really matters is that they're directly opposing one another. Okay, and to cone down, I'm gonna use this part of my thumb, actually not like kind of below my thumb, more of the heel of my palm towards the thumb here. And I'm gonna push down straight down away from myself. So if my body is the registration key, or this is a clock that we're looking at, I'm looking directly at six o'clock, and I'm gonna do this this way so you can actually see this happen. So it looks like that, it actually kind of pushes away from itself. And my right hand, I'm never just using one hand. My right hand should be pressing 
through the left hand. Okay, now because this is going to be a taller vertical piece, I ultimately don't want to bring this down into a squat kind of piece here. So I'm trying to center this fairly tall. And the idea is that if it's on the taller side, when I centered it, then I don't need to throw it as much. And this is a technique that helps uh, to center something taller because you're kind of used to just going all the way down if you know how to center. Uh, but sometimes I'll, I'll push towards myself with my right hand and then push down with my left hand from above and you can kind of meet one another. Another really good, and this is a really good one for people with body problems, back problems, you can center everything like this, is to center towards yourself with these parts of your hands. And it's like you're kind of giving yourself an embrace here. Okay. Someone said I'm throwing without a splash pen. Yes. I don't use them. Partly because I have a washing machine in my house. And the other thing is that uh, keeps me from using too much water. So how do you not use a lot of water? I just use this stuff. I build it up, okay? Build it up. It's slip. And uh, because it's clay and water, it, that means scientifically that it's less wet than water. Science. Okay. So now I'm gonna open this almost as if it was a normal, a normal piece, so my thumb. I use my left thumb. If you use your pointer finger, that's fine. At a certain point, I'm gonna get my pointer finger in here. And this is a technique I developed for myself. Uh, around 2016, I was trying to make these 20 pound jars. Yes, I love that. Yeah, Laura, you should take my, that'd be awesome to have you in the class. Uh, in, in 2016, I was making these 20, I decided this is the summer of 20 pound jars. And uh, none of them ended up being very good. I threw away all of them, I think. Uh, but I did learn a lot. And one of the things that I learned was the ways that I was opening, I was opening the pots and centering them was like as if it was a regular smaller pot. And when you get to this scale, that's a lot of work that you put on things. And I'd always seen videos of people in China, you know, starting with this long log and then drilling their hand down through it. And I said, you know, these guys, they maybe have figured something out that I'm missing. And now for most things that are tall, I do it with this technique. How do you tell how far down it is? You can stick your hand like this. You put your hand here. So I'm gonna go down a little bit further. Now, this is gonna be something that doesn't have a cut foot to it. So I'm going down pretty far. I'm opening, and the way I'm opening here is I have my whole hand at six o'clock, pushing straight back towards myself, but I'm taking my other hand, my right hand, and pushing through my left hand. So never, anytime you're using one hand to do something that requires force, it only makes sense to use the other hand as well, right? Now, this is something, I might try picking this up so you can see it. Eh, my hands are pretty dirty. But this is something that, I, and again, I actually don't know if this is real, but I talked to an engineer once and he was like, yeah, I think that sounds legit. So that's good enough for me. Uh, but one of the things is, uh, <clears throat> you hear all the time, even people who 
maybe are sculptors and are in ceramic studios. They've never thrown a pot a day in their lives. And they're like, well, why did my, why, you hear someone say, why did my pot S crack? An S crack is an S shaped crack that forms on the bottom of pieces. And that happens because the clay particles aren't compressed enough, right? So people will say, compress your bottoms, compress your bottoms. That's what that means if you hear people say that. Uh, and it's true, I think. Uh, but for a technique like this, I have to drill with the tips of my fingers. Whereas for most of the time, I'm using the pads of my fingers on things that are wider. I'm actually kind of hyperextending my fingers or hyperextending my thumb. And I'm using a pretty broad surface, okay? And that's always going to give you better compression. Because just think about it. Think about if you're like smearing peanut butter on a piece on a piece of bread, like I did right before, uh, really quickly before I jumped on this Zoom uh, meeting. You know, if you use the tip of the knife, you know you're going to get these big ridges, okay? Whereas if you use the whole broad side of the knife, you're going to get a nice compact, even coating of peanut butter, okay? So why is that important? Why am I telling you this right now? Because you can't see inside of here, and something that I do to get a little extra compression is on forms like this, I actually open the bottom so that the center is actually a little bit higher than the perimeter of the inside, okay? And that's something that probably we've all, we've all done accidentally, uh, but I'm gonna do it intentionally here because now I'm gonna go in from the inside and I'm gonna use, uh, I'm gonna use a sponge and I'm gonna compress from the center out. And I might end up tearing a little bit of clay off. I'm not worried about that. But because I have extra clay there, I can compress more without going down too thin. And because I'm not going to trim the bottom of this, uh, the thickness of the floor needs to be pretty thin to begin with. So about a, a little bit less than a quarter of an inch, somewhere between a third and a quarter or so, OK? I don't want to be too thin. And because I'm using my right hand here, I'm just gonna use my other hand to stabilize it. The other thing, and it might be just worth it once I'm done with this to actually pick this up and, and show you guys. The other thing that's really important when you're throwing larger pieces of clay, and, and you know, that's always what larger means is relative to uh, who you are and how you work, you know, five pounds is for a lot of people not very big, but for a lot of people it's very big and it can be quite challenging. Uh, and one of the big issues I think students have, I see students having all the time is they've opened up this, they've centered this big piece of clay and they want to open it up, but the inside looks like this. Okay, and if you've ever taken my class, you know, all I talk about is the inside and the outside. You know, if the outside looks like this and the inside looks like that, that's an identity crisis. Okay, the pot doesn't know who it is. It doesn't know if it's this pot or if it's this pot. And when your inside and your outside are so much at odds with one another, it, it can be pretty self-destructive and pots are going to tear themselves apart. Okay, also, if this is a pot that we're not going to trim, because it's gotta be pretty light to begin with, we really need to make sure that the inside of it is nice and square. So that when I go and start to pull, I'm not gonna end up with something that looks like this and have all of this, this sort of hidden vert ramp of clay <clears throat> in here. So I'm just gonna pick up the camera and make sure you guys can see what I'm talking about here. I've got a succession of rags to the sponge. I don't have a sink in my studio which is also uh, has made me much better at using less water. Uh, I just have a bucket that I keep on the floor and, and a sponge. And for three years, I worked with earthenware. It's a nightmare, terrible. I always wanted to do like a Jeff Foxworthy type special, like you might be a potter if, you're, if your uh, bathtub is stained red before you get in it. Okay, what am I doing? I'm showing you this. Let's see, can we make it? Uh, your, this is my laptop is, <laughs> uh, is going to, um, is hooked up. Oh, here we go, now I have all the things. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, 
that my class basically is ceramics uh, stand-up comedy. Um, I remember I once got a 25 on a science test in the fourth grade. And my teacher said, what do you think you're going to do with your life? And I was like, I think I want to be a comedian. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so that's the inside of this thing here. And you can see the inside is, is really squared off at that point. Okay. So that's, that's the important thing that I want to show you guys. Okay. And then I'm going to come in here and I'm going to use this wooden rib to just compress it a little bit more. I love, love, love wooden ribs because they don't bend. They're really strong. Okay. So now, how am I doing on time? That's a half hour. Okay. The rest of this is much, much more fast paced and exciting. We need to see me collapse this thing. It's going to be incredible. Um, <clears throat> so when you do this technique, the bottom of this is very thick, much thicker uh, and taller than it normally would be. Because if you think about it, this is like probably the height of most people's first pull, okay, about. And if I just start pulling with the intensity that I normally would uh, on a piece that is this sort of opened this way, it's going to tear itself in half because I'm going to grab onto too much clay. So I'm actually going to start off and I'm going to count the poles on this. Should be about, should be about three poles, uh, not including the shaping. And I usually don't include this pole, but we'll count this one. So it'd be about three or four poles. And I have a saying uh, that you should count your poles because, sorry, I'm looking into the camera, but I, I want you, I want everyone to take me seriously here. Count your pulls. This is my big thing. Count them. Why do you count them? So you know what you're doing. I see people all the time pulling and pulling and pulling and the clay isn't going anywhere. And I used to bartend for a long time. I was a bartender. And, you know, one thing I observed is that uh, pulling clay is often like drinking in that pulls after six pulls. Maybe you could use one, one more, but after that, they're very unnecessary. They are like drinks after midnight, okay? Nobody needs them, all right? So I'm coming in here, and what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna have my hand in this sort of kind of inefficient pulling shape where I'm, I have my whole hand on here, and I'm gonna actually kind of cone this in slightly before I do this so I don't have to deal with it. And I'm gonna do this kind of evening pull. I'm gonna even it out a little bit, okay? And then we can go ahead, cone this up a bit. Uh-oh. got some interesting stuff happening in here. I think I was talking so much that the, this dried out a little bit. Uh, has detached. No. But anyway, we're going to just go with it. Um, you might consider if this was you, I might recommend actually just starting over at this point. We're going to rock and roll. And I'm going to start to pull here. Let me just kind of All right. Okay. Don't worry. It's fine. It's fine. Nothing to worry about. So when I'm pulling, my inside hand is above my outside hand. It looks like this. Okay. I have my hands. They look like that. I'm going to actually, for bigger pulls, I tend to kind of turn my hand, my hands to my fingers like this. Okay. And I have a sponge in my hand, but rather than this, it's this way. You get more surface area and you can pick up more clay. And my inside hand, is literally quite right above my outside finger. So you'll see a sort of plume, like a mushroom cloud going up. So 
sometimes when these pieces are kind of on the larger side, it gets off center. You can just kind of pull through it. Although the bottom of this is really pretty funky. And I'm gonna do everything I can to keep the rim of this both on the thicker side uh, and also narrow. So if it starts to open up on me, make sure that you close it. People always ask me, you know, this is a very common situation where you are, you know, you've been throwing pots for a year or two. Everything you make is some kind of a bowl. And the best advice I have is to don't make bowls. Make it a cylinder. How do you make it a cylinder? As soon as it starts to come out on you, just choke it back in. Do whatever you gotta do, okay? And then eventually, you won't need to constantly be pushing it back in. But you'll notice after every pull, I'm gonna give the rim of this a little bit of love. I'm gonna show it, kind of bring it back to this area here. And I do this sort of webbing finger compression. And this is also compressing the rim of this as well, so that it's a little bit thicker. And the thicker the rim, it's gonna hold its shape a lot better while I'm pulling. Slow this down a little. And I'm throwing standing up, if you couldn't tell. Whoa, man. Not supposed to happen. That's supposed to happen. So really quick, we're gonna just uh, we're gonna just take a, a really a brief uh, pause, and I'm gonna I'm just gonna grab five pounds of clay very quickly, and uh, this is my specialty. We'll slice the video, Hawk, and no one will ever know. Except uh, I'm, I'm totally I'm all about it actually because uh, I mess up all the time, and. Uh, you know, I think it's really important for people to, to see that I mess up all the time. And, uh, you know, I've been throwing pots since 2004 when I took my first uh, pottery class. And every day that I throw pots, I collapse some pots without, without question. So that's only Does anyone have any questions in the meantime? I don't know if you guys did you guys hear that? Does anybody have any questions in the meantime? I'm still here. It's a good time to ask me. What are you wedging on? I'm wedging on a canvas table. I just had to re-canvas the table because I, uh, here, let's see, you can, this is my table. This is a uh, painting, some studio painting stuff. Okay, you can see me wedging here. And this is just a poorly, poorly constructed table that I, I built from scrap wood. I've got a great lumber yard in my area. It's called Menches, Menches Lumber. And uh, I've been getting wood from them since I moved into this area. I lived in East Harlem. And uh, they're great. They're, they're, they're a really uh, kind of funny group of <laughs> hub guys who, who run that place. And uh, very generous with end cuts and stuff like that. I also buy wood for my lawn furniture and stuff like that. Pat patio furniture. I don't really have a lawn.
Okay, nothing happened. Will you adjust the- Yes, thank you. Just a little bit. Thank you very much. Good, good call. There we go. Okay. And Nadine chatted, are you also a life coach? Am I also a life coach? No. No, you don't want any of this. <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you don't want my life advice. Um, okay. But I do, you know, I, uh, I grew up very religious. Not a lot of people know that about me. I grew up, uh, I was Lutheran. And so... Uh, Lutheran. Yes. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. You're from the Midwest, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and I spent a lot of time uh, in church growing up. And so I tend to kind of sermonize a lot. Um, but it's sort of the way I think things through. And, you know, I think a lot of the stuff that we do in the studio it's really easy to uh, isolate it from the rest of our lives and uh, not getting, this is not me getting serious or anything like that. Uh, but I think we do that because for most people, uh, it's uh, a break from your day to day. And so there's maybe a tendency to not want to make connections to the rest of your life because you want to leave those things behind while you're making things. And I'm actually not saying that you shouldn't do that. Um, if you can, if you can compartmentalize your life and do that, that's great. It's a great skill I wish I had. Um, but it's often a way to get people to understand what you're actually thinking about, what you're talking about. And if you can relate it to things in your life, it just becomes that much more real. All right. Thank you. Okay. Opening this thing up. Anyway, this is a good chance for you guys to see what, what you missed if you were zoning out into my long tangent. So lucky to have the studio here. Just compressing my floor. <clears throat> And I might have skipped this part. I think this is almost where I lost the pot before. Um, but I always call this thing that I'm doing right now, I call this my sort of repositioning or relocation plan. That whenever you open the pot up and you've done your floor, you've done all that stuff, you don't want to skip the relocation plan. 
because this is where you're setting yourself up for the, the path forward, right? And if you skip this, you just kind of move in from opening to pulling, uh, it's really easy for things to fall apart. And I decided, uh, partly because it's gonna be much easier to pull, but I made the bottom on this much wider than the last one. I don't know if you guys saw that happen, but this is something, it doesn't happen very often to me anymore. It happens particularly when I do this pull, but that happens when you have uneven pressure on the inside and the outside. And the reason why it happened to me, usually it happens on the outside for people, okay? A ring of clay goes up. And my advice is just always just pretend it's not there and just follow through. Don't stop or anything. And then you can just sort of take this off at the end. But that was because I was doing this pull where the inside actually looked like this from the opening and the outside was like this. Remember I said, if I started pulling right away, I would tear it off. So that was me just pushing from the inside and applying some pressure on the outside, uh, which ended up making it a little bit on the uneven side. Okay. All right, back, back to where we were, where we started, where we left off. So I'm pulling. Notice my left hand, how my thumb for the, at least that first pull was wrapped around the entire rim. That's doing two things, it's sort of stabilizing the rim and keeping it a little bit on the thicker side, but also it's preventing the rim from going off center. That's a really useful technique when you're making uh, big bowls also. Bringing my rim in and compressing the rim to make it thicker, which will also hold the shape and making sure there's no water in the inside. Very useful tip in between your poles. I come in here and I make a little undercut, just my finger, and that's gonna allow me to pick up more clay. And how many people are in this thing right now? We have nine. Okay. Hi, everybody. Okay. Other pro tip when you're working larger, get your forearm wet. Two reasons. Number one, if your rim, if your forearm touches this, it's going to want to chatter and stick to it. But the other thing is that I actually will use my forearm as kind of a stabilizing mechanism. In the same way I had my thumb on the outside, I'll have my forearm on the inside, keeping it from going off center. On this up a little bit. Was that was that the, the third pull? I think so. Three or four. I think so. I don't usually count that first pull, that relocation one. So we'll count it. I think that makes this the third. But this last this will be the last pull before I start to shape it.
actually have a little brick here to get a little more leverage. You notice I just grew two inches. Don't worry about the wobble. I know I said that before I was lying, but this time it's fine. So people always ask me, Hawkin, how do you know when to stop pulling? And the answer is when it starts to fall apart. That sounds like a really irresponsible thing to tell people, but I've had really good potters say that to me, and I think it's true. Okay. I had to make that a little wider to get my thumb down there. <clears throat> this is where my wooden rib comes in handy. I can find it. I know you're in here. Oh, here it is. It's on the floor. Okay. So, I love this. this is one of my favorite wooden ribs. It's got a little hole for me to hold on to. Okay. And the reason why this is really good is you can see it's rounded up here. It's got a square edge on this part, but it's round. And I think the problem with this one that comes in most beginner pottery kits, and don't get me wrong, man, I love this rib. If I ever had a tattoo, maybe it would be this one. <laughs> um, but the problem with this thing is that on something like this, this point is going to dig into here, okay? And even you can sort of angle it away so you don't, but then you're usually going to have a groove on here from the bottom of this. Whereas because this thing is rounded on the top here, you're fine. Now I do this, whether it's a smaller pot or, or a bigger pot, I always do this step. This isn't a pull really. It's more of just a, it does two things. It kind of is a check-in. It's a how you doing to the whole pot that's telling me, okay, it's thick here, it's thin here. Uh, whatever. It's also going to even the whole thing out, compress the walls, make the pot a little bit drier so that I can go ahead and start shaping it. I gotta open this up a little bit more. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's narrower than my forearm. balance up on here. Okay. So a little trick I have Is it pretty thin down here? Well, what I'll do is I'll actually, because I can't trim this, I'm gonna take a little bit of clay off of right here uh, before I start to shape it. because you can't really trim something like this. Don't 
time wise. Okay. We'll get this done pretty quickly. <clears throat> so now I'm going to use uh, a metal rib on the inside and a wooden rib on the outside. And if this hadn't been going on kind of on the longer side, I'd maybe spend a little bit more time uh, evening this out, but I think we're good to move on. And it's a metal, a wooden rib on the inside. I got a lot of these wooden ribs. This is a really good one. None of these wooden ribs are more than $7 uh, from, from most ceramic supply places. This is a great one. It's really good because you can hold it like that or, or like this if you can't get your finger in there. But I like that groove. That's another thing from my summer of 20 pound jars. This is a great one. A lot of people have this. They don't know how to use it. This is just really fantastic rib. I'm going to use this one. And I'm going to use my metal rib. The wooden rib is at a sharp angle. Okay, imagine this is the inside. The metal rib is very soft angle. Okay, and the metal rib, I call it almost the infinity rib because you can make any shape I want. And the idea is that now I don't have to use any more water, which is good because it's falling apart, you know. Just giving this a little check in here. Okay. okay, man, this is crazy down here. And this picture form that I'm making, so it's a sort of traditional picture form, kind of based off of pictures you would see in like uh, medieval Europe, like jugs, I love those things. Uh, what's that painting? I'm sure someone in the audience knows uh, of the, the open air medieval butcher shop, the, the meat market, anybody? Anyway, you could just see someone, you know, with one of these, uh, some mead. Central. How's that look? Okay. Looking at this thing. So the other benefit of the wooden rib is you might notice when you're shaping something that's round like this, that it wants to collapse on itself. The inside part and the outside part are really different. But this gives you a little bit of a, of a shoulder to hang out on. OK. Okay, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, uh, I'm going to pull the top of this just a little bit. Or no, we can just move on. Uh, very useful tool is just a house paint brush so that I can finish this area off without pouring water into the whole thing.
Okay. We're going to go ahead and Okay. And before I finish my, my spout, which I'm about to show you, I'm just gonna take a piece of plastic here, fold it over, just fold it over. And you could add some water to it, but there's enough on here that I don't really need to. And I'm just gonna sort of finish this rim off. So that's good to go. And this is not reflected on the one that I'm about to show you, but you can, this thing kind of is at, telling me it wants some sort of little grooves in here. Okay, I just did that with uh, the edge of this. Maybe you can see the profile a little bit better against my darker shirt. Okay. And now pulling a spout, uh, I often advise people that they throw a wide cylinder and pull a bunch of spouts, okay? Uh, but it's not one of those things that comes easily uh, or that just because you can throw pots doesn't mean that you're gonna be able to do this. Um, and I'm actually gonna try and do it kind of like over my shoulder so you guys can see me do some of it, uh, hopefully. Um, but how, how do you pull a spout? You don't need to let this set up. This is good to go right now. Uh, if it's really, really, really falling apart, then maybe set it aside. But you wanna get to the spout uh, for a pulled spout, not an added on spout. Uh, a pulled spout, you wanna get onto it right away when the clay is still really soft and wet. Um, uh, at the driest it could be, it should be no drier than clay out of the bucket or out of the bag, okay? Uh, if it's any drier than that, so that means as dry as it was before we started throwing it. If it's any drier than that, it's gonna start to split and crack, even if it's pretty nice plastic clay, okay? So how do you do it? There's a bunch of different ways. Surprise, sounds like pottery. There's a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, you can pull the spout this way, right, where I'm, I'm taking two hands, but pulling up and stopping before the rim. So you actually never touch the very tip of it. Uh, and you can also, I also do it by going back and forth. You'll see I'll do a kind of a combination of the two. But my fingers need to be wet. And the rocking back and forth looks like this. I'm just sort of pinching it. I'm going back and forth. They kind of make it a little thinner down here. And now, can you see that at all? Yeah, it's perfect. Let me see if I can do that. How's that? Can you see yeah. behind? Yeah. yeah, it's perfect. Okay, so I'm pushing up like this. And notice that my fingers are actually not touching the rim at all. I'm stopping just before. And why is that? Because if you touch the rim, you're gonna put a groove, you're gonna put little grooves in there that you're not gonna be able to get out. And the light on this is making it look a little bit messier than it is, but it's pretty good. And the benefit you can see is it makes the rim higher, okay? Yeah, that's there we go. So now this is me kind of going back and forth. And I will say this is one of those things where you really need to be alternating between clean and dry hands, which is something that I love. I can't wait to be back at Brooklyn Clay because you guys have rags for all of our students and that's not very common. And I'm always telling people to bring a rag but man, so useful because I need this hand to be clean now. And uh, I just had a rag, look at that, really easy. Clean hand. So now this part, what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna try and do it like this. 
so you guys can see me do it. Um, but uh, this this is called the pull, the actual sort of making the throat of it. And basically what I'm doing is I'm wetting the tip of my finger here and I'm going like this, rocking it back and forth. And uh, my advice for people making uh, pitcher spouts is uh, always pull them more than you think you need to, okay? Uh, so that they're more articulated. And, you know, maybe that's very much uh, about a kind of pitcher spout that's very popular in the last 20 years or so. And uh, in the books will look pretty dated or something like that. But um, that, that's my advice, right? Go, go further than you think you need to. Let's see. This is a little far out for me because I'm trying to look at the camera. Here we go. Kind of going in underneath the handle. And I, I'm going to give you a close up of this in a second. But what's really important is that I'm building up this kind of slip line, this hard, actually sharp line that's on the surface of this. Uh, right here, there's a kind of a sharp edge. And that's gonna cut the water. The other thing that's gonna cut the water is I'm actually, something that's pretty counterintuitive, I'm gonna make this spout go below 90 degrees. Okay? I'm actually gonna make it go a little bit further down. I'm gonna kind of pull this out make this a little bit wider. But if this goes south of 90 degrees, then it can't really dribble, okay? So if you've ever made pouring spouts, uh, getting them not to dribble is the ultimate challenge. And uh, even though I, I know I always make a, a lot of attention to, to dealing with that, sometimes they still dribble, it's really annoying. And, uh, you know, does it really matter to other people in the world? Probably not, but it's one of those things that if you're a potter, you end up spending, you know, the rest of your life being like, how oh, do I make this not dribble? Um, and one of the things is having the tip of this actually be just south of 90 degrees, because if the, if the tip is, say, 90 degrees, well, water can sort of dribble down over this. But if I'm pouring it and it's like this, it's going to go to here, but it's not going to go back like that, okay? It would have to defy gravity. It would have to be uh, a sort of magical substance uh, that, was, that was weightless, or maybe in, uh, in a space station, it would go, go back around like that, but that's it. Okay, so here's the spout, and I'll give you a close-up of this, and then, uh, you, wait, there's more. Uh, <laughs> you think that that's it. Uh, that's the spout, okay? And you might see that there's like some little kind of like fingerprint marks on the side there. Truthfully, there's a lot of my face there. Uh, truthfully, that doesn't matter. Uh, it usually is not going to show up under most glazes. But if you want to get rid of it, wait till the pot is basically leather hard, okay? But you can see there's kind of a sharp edge right there, okay? And what's really important is you build it up uh, there's a lot of my complexion, actually. Okay, uh, you build that this edge up with the soft with the soft slip that builds up from your finger. But actually, notice that the actual spout's quite thick. So if the whole thing was so paper thin that it's going to cut the liquid and it's going to pour really well, well, that doesn't matter if the second time you use it, you break the spout off. Okay, then you know it was like one of those things like uh, like the '60s where you really had to be there, man. Um, but I want this to kind of live its life and, and do its thing. So that's that thing. But this is a cool trick. This is a trick that I learned uh, from uh, a former teacher of mine, Linda Sakura, and uh, she learned it from uh, a great potter in New York, uh, Mark Shapiro. Not to be confused with another very good potter from the area, Jeff Shapiro, but Mark Shapiro. And um, this is one of those things where when I saw it, everyone in the room went, <gasps> and it's a 50-50. Uh, I certainly won't hear it because you guys are muted, but sometimes people think it's really cool and sometimes people are like, well, whatever, okay? Um, but you gotta have another reason to have dry hands. I'm gonna come in here with dry hands. <clears throat> and I'm gonna grab onto this thing. 
and I'm just going to pull up and I'm going to hold it for about 30 seconds. And kind of lean it back a little bit. And it's going to relax slightly, but not that much. And that's what gives you that kind of, uh, I want to pour look. Okay. And you can at this point come in here and do a little bit of this stuff, you know, but I kind of tell people to avoid it. So that's what this looks like. Okay. And you have a handle here. So now uh, through the magic of the internet, this pot's going to become leather hard real quick. And we're going to toss a handle on here. Do people, now I have a handle that I pulled already uh, that's ready to go, a couple of different ones. Do people want to see me pull a handle and then I'll just use the, use it, the leather hard one? Maybe next, Maybe yeah. Since we're getting close to the, yeah. yeah. Okay, not a problem. Okay. So, this is, this is, uh, this picture is leather hard now and uh, somehow the rings on the top are gone. Um, yeah, I got a lot of these. This is actually because uh, so people are commenting on these handprints. I get a, a mosquito infestation, okay, in the summer, in the summertime. And, and they drive me fucking nuts. I mean, they drive me crazy because I'm here. And I mean, I don't know if you can see, but like I've got like these crazy veins all, all over. I got a serious vascular system going and they just are attacking me constantly. So that's just me like, ah, you bastards. Uh, how do you deal with this picture? Notice the edge here is a little bit sharp. So you just come in here and roll it with your finger to smooth it out. And then it's flat, but I'm gonna take the heel of my palm and I'm gonna just come in here like this, just once. And that's gonna give it a little bit of a depression, okay? And that'll make it sit better. Uh, once it's fired, okay? And I've got a handle. I'm gonna do this all right here. Okay, and oh, this is perfect. Uh, this is a handle that I pulled. Okay, and uh, it's already pulled. What's the consistency that I like to put my handles on? There's all different kinds of handle stuff. This is, uh, I would describe this as about the same consistency as clay out of the bucket, okay? So you can see, I mean, maybe it's a little bit stiffer than that. You can see it's gotta have a lot of life to it, but if I touch it, look, ma, clean hands, okay? So that means no slip is coming off of my fingers or anything like that. And you actually don't need a lot of handle for a pitcher this big. And I'm gonna set the, I was picked up the wet one. I'm gonna set this one right here. Although that's quite precarious. Okay. And I'm just thinking you know, there's sort of different approaches. One approach would be the pulled handle, which I don't know if I can capture that uh, on screen, uh, but we might try that another time. Uh, I have one ready to go. One respect would be a pulled handle that's coming off this way. I think for something like this, I want actually uh, a kind of uh, springboard handle, okay? And for advice on, on handles, for spouted vessels, for pitchers or teapots, generally for pots that hold water, a wider handle is good because it's gonna diffuse the weight of the, of the pot on your hand. If it's narrow, it's gonna feel a lot heavier. Think about the shoulder strap on your luggage, okay? That Valance shoulder strap, all right? That's there to diffuse the weight on your shoulder. Same kind of thing. And this is five pounds. It's gonna lose a little bit of weight from the water. It's gonna take more weight back on from the glaze. And then a gallon of water, I think is like maybe somewhere between five and seven pounds. So all of a sudden that's like 10, 12 pounds, which is kind of a lot to whip around the uh, dinner table. And um, 
I'm just going to take my wire tool here. And this is just a good way to kind of gauge. Also, string is really useful. But you should just have an idea what you would want this handle to look like. I think that would look pretty good. You, <laughs> I didn't realize that this is invisible to you. Um, there you go. OK, I want something like that, right? Uh, including the spring. So that gives me something that's about the length of, of this thing. OK, that's pretty good. And I'm going to come in here. One of my other favorite tools, I would also <clears throat> normally draw, clean my hands off. But we're just going to go with it. It really dries your skin out the clay. One of my favorite uh, tools is just cheap paring knives, OK? Get these at uh, Kmart or the dollar store or something like that. I just love these knives. They're so good. Uh, instead of the fettling knives that you get uh, at ceramic supply places. And the way that I pulled this, uh, in case you can't tell, I pulled it this way, whatever, we'll we won't talk about that. But then I sort of had it drying on the table. So this was, so it was drying in the air. And I've got a thicker spot up here. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna leave some of this thick spot so that I can kind of sculpt with it a little bit. And I think traditionally a pulled handle off of the pot would give you the thicker part would be on the top, okay, because from pulling it. And it can be fun to not totally ignore uh, traditional aesthetics, but to kind of just sort of uh, move them around a little bit. So sometimes I like to just have the thicker part actually be on the bottom, gives the uh, actual handle a finishing point, and I'll have the thinner part be up at the top. Now, I have never been very good at cutting this at an angle, okay? So a lot of the times if the, if the handle is going to come off at an angle, people cut that in there and they put the handles on leather hard. I don't do that because I'm not very good at anticipating the way the angles are going to work out, right? So I always like to put my handles together when they're pretty wet or what rather pretty moist and plastic still. And rather than try and cut this to be a perfect 45 degree angle, I'm going to show it to you. I think actually you're going to get a pretty good view of this. I'm going to, and I want to make sure, this is just a me thing. I want to make sure the rounder side is on the inside so that it wraps around your fingers nicely. But I'm going to use the table here. And it's important if, if you don't have a, a canvas work table like I do over here, if you're just on the wood or on the pottery batch, put some newspaper down. And I'm going to come in here. And I'm going to just sort of sculpt a 45 degree angle by pushing against the table. And then I'm going to kind of come in here like this. Now, you'll notice I, I'm, I'm going to have the handle be quite close to the actual pot itself. And I'm going to sort of sculpt this side here by pushing down like this. Try to make sure you can see me here. Uh, but the handle needs to be pretty close to the pot itself because that's going to make it uh, feel a lot lighter. If the handle's farther away, it's going to feel heavier. So although I love, uh, you know, kind of 19th century neoclassical Wedgwood set with the big kind of bombastic uh, handles. Uh, you know, this is something to me that I actually, I use pictures like this all the time. Um, you know, I, maybe not everybody does, but, but I, I use them. You can do it. It's, it's real. So now I have something that looks like this, okay? And I'm kind of coming in here. You can see, though, I have that beveled edge. Uh, instead of cutting it, I just sort of sculpted it in there. Oh yeah, it looks good. Pretty good. I, I gotta say, sometimes this, the mirror, the, the video thing is so unnerving most of the time. But you know, I, I should be, this is also moving all around on me here. I should be working with a, a mirror more often so that I can see what it is that I'm doing. Um, and I'm gonna just like, I'm gonna set this up against here so it doesn't move, there we go. So I'm sort of 
every other minute I'm kind of freaked out when I see myself, like I forgot that I existed or something in here. Uh, but then it's also, wow, look, you know, like I wish I could get that vantage point. So it's a thing that people do. They have a mirror in the studio. Okay, and now my little, you know, let's put this a little bit further down. Yeah, there we go. That's, that's I think, a little bit better. Okay. So, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold this in place and I'm gonna just sort of trace inside. I don't need to go around the entire thing because I have a pretty good idea of what the handle looks like. So, I don't need to trace it exactly and Let me give myself a little notation down here. And that gives me this little kind of box. Now I know where I'm scoring and slipping, so I don't have to do any cleanup. And when you're scoring, I'm going in pretty deep about, uh, you know, almost a third of an inch, an eighth of an inch or so. If you're going in less than that, it's really just uh, to make you feel better about not about scoring and slipping. Uh, it's just a superficial thing that is, is for your own vanity to say, I scored and slipped it. So you really got to go in nice and deep. And I don't use slurry. Uh, I make my own slurry on here. And again, that's one of those things, if you don't have a lot of handles cracking on you ever, then don't change that part of your life. That's working. Um, and, but this, I find it causes less cracking because a lot of times people add a lot of slip and the slip will actually, um, actually be the thing that's cracking. So that's something I really, I think I've only noticed because I'm a teacher, but in my experience, you know, 50% of the handles that crack are because of the stuff people did thinking that it would stop the handle from cracking. So all the coils and stuff that people add in there to reinforce it, that ends up coming and biting you back in the ass, I think. But what I'm doing here is I'm scoring pretty deep and then I have a brush that I've painted, you're sort of flooding it with water and then I score again. And depending on how wet the piece is, I might score, I might repeat this process two or three times. And I'm going to score the handle a little bit, not too much. It doesn't, doesn't need to be scored that much because it's pretty wet and this piece is pretty wet. Now, if the handle was drier and the pot was also a little bit drier, then I would maybe uh, be saying a sort of different story and I would really say you got to score this part really well. But also since I have so much surface area that I'm coming in contact with on this piece, I think I'm pretty good. Okay. Also, I'm just looking at this. I kind of put this, this is it's cleaned up. Make sure you always look at the uh, spout dead on so that you don't put the thing on crooked. Coming in here and I'm now pushing this in. And you always kind of give it kind of a little bit of a wiggle. Okay, no step is more important in attaching clay to clay than a wiggle. Someone is asking how long did I let the handle dry? You know, I don't have an amount of time that it takes. It's really relative to your studio and how much water you used. So for me, I pulled it just before uh, I started the demo. Um, but if my studio were drier, it would maybe take much less time than that. If it's raining outside, I might have to have like the dehumidifier and the heater on to get it to go. Um, but basically, you're going to let it dry until it is 
uh, a, a very specific consistency. It's going to be uh, sort of clay right out of the bucket, a little bit more plastic than that. And basically, I'm just keep coming back to it and I touch it. And the moment that slip stops coming off on my finger, that's basically when I know it's ready to go. So I push this in here. And I'm going to come in, I want to give this a little more kind of boom. Okay, I kind of don't want this handle coming out much further than this point here, because this is the center of gravity. So if I'm out here, it's going to be a little bit much. How's that? Okay, I think that's it. Okay, so that's a picture. And uh, it looks really big right now. It is big. It will shrink a lot. It'll shrink almost 20%. It's porcelain. And it'll be a really usable size. It'll be great uh, for a barbecue uh, when we can all uh, be less than six feet away from each other. And you'll say, man, I'm so glad Hawk and Tommy had to make this. And just to follow up, I'll give you a couple little detail shots here. So you can see the benefit of this. What I'll do, well, I'm actually gonna come in here. I mean, it's, you know, I can really spend a lot of time doing these things, but you can see I don't have any cleanup to do. Okay, it's a pretty clean application. And my whole thing is I just try to not have to do a lot of fedataling, a lot of this and that, because uh, I have mild, you know, sort of OCD and if I do it, if I leave a lot of stuff for me to clean up, I'll spend just all day. I'll be in here just doing this all day. But this is a fun little trick. I'm gonna come in here you know, with a wet thumb. Okay, and this kind of brought this thing in a little bit. I'm not too worried. I'm just gonna come out here. Although that was kind of cool the way it pushed in. Okay, but that's it. And anyway, you can see that's what that, let's see it. There you go. You can see that's what that, that looks like. Okay, and if this was a cup, that'd be a place uh, for someone to rest their finger on. Now, only a giant would be able to rest their little finger down here, uh, but it's sort of a nice terminating thing and kind of has a traditional look. It sort of kind of ties the whole thing together a little bit, sticks it on, okay? And that's it. Any, any questions on that? Beautiful. Yeah, if anybody has a question, uh, you can unmute yourself if you want. And I'm listening. I'm just going to take a sponge and wipe my forearms off. If people want a Reader's Digest version of all that, I can give you a quick summation. Or the piece of advice that I had to give you guys. The advice I had was, number one, use clay that is not too soft, okay? And you should uh, privilege the consistency of the clay as being the most important thing to you before you sit down, okay? So whatever you got to do to get it to be the right consistency, do it. Don't try doing this with really soft clay. Also, do your wrists a favor and don't try doing it with really, really stiff clay either. It'll work a couple of times, but eventually it's going to be a bad problem for you in your life. And also, uh, throwing tip was centering taller for throwing things that are taller. Counting your pulls, being mindful of it, okay, just so you know what you're doing. You, once you start to count the pulls, you're going to find very quickly that a lot of the pulling that you're doing is unnecessary, and it's just making the pot uh, weaker and want to fall down, okay? Uh, the other tip that I had that maybe I didn't point out well enough that is really useful is that when you're making a pitcher, because you can't really trim it, uh, at least the kind of pitchers that I make that have these sort of large spouts on them, you can't really trim them. So you've got to throw them pretty well. And one thing I didn't show you guys is you can take your pin tool and stick your pin tool through the wall of the pot to your finger and that tells you how thick the pot is okay and I'm gonna be real it should be for the bottom of your pitcher it shouldn't be thicker than that that's you know about a quarter of an inch it really can't be a much thicker than that 
It's going to be even at that thickness, it's going to be kind of on the heavy side. So a trick that I have is number one, do that. That's really useful. Number two, the number two trick uh, in terms of getting it to be a little bit lighter is to actually use uh, your wooden knife. And if I did have a tattoo, this is actually what it would be, not the, rib, not the uh, right angle rib. Uh, but use this guy, your wooden knife or your J tool, uh, depending on who told you what it's called, or a pointy stick. And while it's still a cylinder, before I've shaped it, I cut, you know, you saw I cut a little, a bead of clay that was like kind of this, this wide, you know. I took just that little last bit of clay off. And that, that makes a big difference. You know, if I, went, if I put that into a ball, it'd be about, you know, the size of a golf ball. And if you would weigh that, that's gonna be like almost like a, almost a quarter of a pound. So that's kind of a big, that's kind of a big deal. You know, a quarter of one pound when it's five pounds altogether. That's actually a lot of material that you don't need down there. And I do it before I shape it. Because if I've shaped this thing and then I wanna come in here with that, you're gonna end up with a really disjointed looking bottom. And, and if you just think about, you know, pictures that you've made in your life or pots that you've seen around studios, you see that a lot. A round form, someone doesn't wanna trim and they've used this wooden knife at the end and it kind of gives you this flat thing. It's not gonna be smooth and graceful the way you want it. So here, you know, I did that before uh, I actually started shaping it, okay? And then the other thing that I said was, uh, if you've never done it before, using a metal rib on the outside and a wooden rib on the inside, okay? This way you don't need to use any water. It's great. Takes a little getting used to. The wooden rib is at a sharp angle. The metal rib is at a soft angle, okay? And they're mimicking one another. And then for the spout, the advice I had was do it right away. Don't wait, okay? And uh, the other advice that I had was don't touch the rim of the pot ever, okay? And uh, I, we use my forearm, my, the part of, this part of my finger like this, rock it back and forth. And then if you want that extra, that extra hawk and push, uh, dry hands on the spout, lift up, hold it for 30 seconds, and it relaxes a little bit, but it gives you this kind of nice lifted look. Uh, and then the last piece of advice, the most important one that took me a really long time to kind of come to terms with is having the tip of this actually be, whoa, dark. It's the lights bouncing off of the pot. Uh, having the tip of this actually come a little bit south of 90, excuse me, of 90 degrees. That's those, those Frank's uh, hot dogs, man. Um, <laughs> a little bit south of 90 degrees. That's going to keep the spout from dribbling back on itself. Okay. And handles. That's a handle. <laughs> that easy. Yeah. Maybe we'll do a demo on handles. Yes, I'd love that. That was yeah. awesome, Hawken. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really convinced I want to take your class. Thank you so much for doing this. It was like, awesome. it was great. Um, well, you, you know where to find me, you know? <laughs> um, okay, is everyone good? Any, any last minute questions? I see some of my students on here. After this ends, feel free to just sort of shoot me a message if you have any questions that you don't want to talk about in public. Okay, but it's good to see you guys. Thanks, and, uh, and yeah, keep up, keep uh, people out there, make sure you're keeping on checking out the Brooklyn Clay Instagram because they're doing these uh, Zooms all the time and it's a great resource. And I know we're all kind of stuck inside going crazy and it's kind of a fun thing to look at. I've been checking them out and hopefully you'll see me on them uh, in the future. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Hawken. Thank you guys. Thanks, Hawken. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you.